Oh, they got a brother Joe, and they got another. Did they have another sister? Yeah, there's four or five of them. Now yeah, he and Becky are always picking on each other. Well, good morning. Morning. Hey guys, Hello. come on in here. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Oh. Well, not yet. Or race, race maybe. That's what I just asked him. He wasn't sure. Did you know, Scott? What's that? So the locks are. Uh, they had a race last night, so I'd be surprised if they're here today. Uh, no, there's a race today. Is there a race today as well? Yeah. Oh, wow. Must have been double dead. Wow. Yeah. 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 St. Louis. St. Louis. Oh, mm -hmm. they could have came to church and then went to the race. Well, <laughs> 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 you, <know, laughs> yeah. you tell them that next weekend. <laughs> you guys keep it busy? Oh, yes. Very busy. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Let's pray. Uh, I want to pray for uh, Pastor Dave, and he's out ministering to his boy Nick out in the, on the West Coast and uh, giving watch care over his boy. And we all know when you're trying to find your way in this world, especially a young man, that you need some uh, love from mama, but especially daddy at times. So daddy's out uh, doing what he should be doing, taking care of, taking care of uh, Nick and just pray for those guys because uh, that's a tough, it's tough enough to be 20 something in this world, let alone do it on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Woo! Now that's a tall glass of water if I ever saw one. That's, that's not a small uh, thing to accomplish. So I know God with his strength can help, but uh, I know, I know it'll be, it'll be just fine, but we want to pray for them. What else can we pray for today? With Shirley Lastly and yep. Jack Love. Right. Yep. Shirley's report was a a night from uh, H E double hockey sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, three kidney stones passed throughout the night. So she is uh, feels like she's been through a war, but they may she may go home tonight. They're they're thinking maybe go on home because they're gone. So no pain. You know it's crazy. You know it's. Once they're gone, they're gone. But my goodness, getting rid of them is the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember my dad's first one, and my dad was the toughest man I knew. And he just said, "Oh no!" He said that little bitty thing you couldn't even hardly see. He said that uh, that just about did me. <laughs> and I had seen him go through some stuff, but I said, "Oh gosh." Yeah, and uh, Jack had a stroke. Uh, we don't know the. It doesn't look like it's a major one, but uh, the way Judy explained it, he'll be in um, ICU for close observation. Just watch him, make sure he doesn't get, you know, something happen from it. But so far, it's just watch and see, is he going to be all right? So, yeah, they're at, uh, both of them are with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we will uh, do our lesson. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for the, every believer today as they gather together with their other believers. We pray for all the worship services that they would glorify you today in a world that chooses most often not to acknowledge you at all. And Lord, help us to do our part to love you and worship you today. Continue to give watch care out there on the West Coast. We know you're just as strong there as you are here. And uh, Lord, give uh, wisdom to PD and uh, just help Nick to know your presence in a greater way today than ever before in his life. Lord, be with Shirley. Wow, what a night. What a night. And I know, Father, you held her hand through it. Lord, it is not your will that we avoid all suffering but it is your will that we see a day when all suffering is completely gone. And I thank you, Father, for her restored health. Get back to where she can live some life and be with Jack and Judy and give them peace, Lord, that they need to get through this time in their lives as well. Now, Lord, uh, be with us in our lesson and may you be honored and glorified as we seek to please you. In Jesus name. Amen. All right. First Corinthians chapter 13. We're in the. The love chapter, not on the love boat, but the love chapter. Did anybody ever watch the love boat when they were going, hey? Oh. <laughs> First, Corinthians, First Corinthians 13, they did. <laughs> I think some of their voyages have all since sailed. That ship has sailed. 
Oh, uh, yeah. The love boat. Remember that? There was an article on the yeah. paper yesterday, a little magazine, and it had shows from the 50s that were so popular. Oh. Walton, Sonny, and Oh, yeah. Um, I liked the Waltons all oh, for, for a long time. Yeah. yeah. I didn't get a lot of Sonny and Cher, but uh, well, apparently it was like a good show. Times. Yeah, I got hooked on Andy Griffiths. So. Oh, PD. Oh, absolutely. Hello to all. Yeah. From uh, four hours in a jet plane to get there. So on a jet plane, don't know when I'll be back again. Remember that? Who did? Is that John Denver? Leaving on a jet plane. I mean, I'm feeling nostalgia with music all of a sudden. What's what's wrong with me? All right, chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak with tongues of men, in other words, you know what tongue speaking is, being able to speak someone else's language uh, on the spur of the moment without learning it, okay? And he says, and of angels, because there were people saying, well, I have a special language. I can talk like the angels, which we don't, that wasn't a real thing. That was just people saying that they could do that. And Paul said, well, even if I could do that, he says, but do not have love. I've become a noisy gong. Did you ever see the gong show? Boy, that was a startling. It's kind of like the buzzers on America's Got Talent yeah. now. Somebody will be in doing their act, and all of a sudden Simon will go, and it'll just, <laughs> it'll just scare the judges to death. You should have done it 10 minutes sooner. Right, <laughs> 10 minutes sooner, right. And then he'll say, you should just go work at McDonald's. You can't sing, you know, something like that. Well, the gong show, if you remember, it would be a talent. Somebody's doing a talent trying to win the show. And then a judge would just stand up and wallop that big gong. Right. It's annoying. Right. It would be. Now, if you were if you were listening to a band concert and they were hitting their cymbals together. This is the same word, by the way. And that would be a pleasant as long as it goes along, especially with Star Spangled Banner. It just it really. But what if they just walked up behind you and there's no music playing and they just go <laughs> right behind you? <laughs> that would just, it'd be about as annoying as anything anybody could do. That's what Barney did to that's, Andy. That's what Barney did to Andy. <laughs> remember that? That, that? Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, when Barney did that to Andy. Uh, not, not good. So he says, that's what he's trying to get us to see. It's just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So someone that has some great gift of the spirit, but they're just, they don't love anybody. They don't have any love. And this is agape love we're talking about uh, today. If I have the gift of prophecy and, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, in other words, there was a gift that someone had back then before the scriptures were completed. They knew everything that Jesus had taught. They could just say it. So they would be somewhere. And remember Jesus in John 14 said, uh, think not about what you're going to say, but when you're arrested and you're going to be flogged and all that, I'll give you exactly what to say. I'll bring it to all your remembrance. And of course, when they wrote the scriptures down, they were inspired to the Holy Spirit and they could write the, it could write down exactly what the spirit wanted to have written down. He said, even if you could do that. And today it would be like saying, if you have every Bible verse memorized, then that's great. But if you don't have love, it's worthless. It's, it's even worse than worthless. It's like a gong in your ear. It's just annoying, right? Is, does that make sense? Uh, so if I have the gift of prophecy, I know all mysteries, all knowledge, and, if I ha and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Now, what is faith that can move mountains? Well, you remember Jesus told the guys sitting outside the temple, he said, if you, can, if you have enough faith, you can say to this mountain, be cast into the sea. Now, that is what Jesus was saying there is not that you can literally take a mountain and throw it into an ocean. What he's saying there is, if you say to this mountain, now the mountain that had the temple on it, that was their way. They would go through the legal law system, right? And that's where the temple was sitting on this mountain. He said, "You, when you have enough faith, you can say to this mountain, I no longer need you. In other words, I don't have to have the law system anymore. I can just turn to Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's saying there. If you have the greatest 
redemptive ability to, I mean, you can preach redemption and salvation. I mean, there is nothing you don't know about the Bible or you can't teach in the Bible, but you don't love with agape love. It's, it's worthless. Now, this is pretty heavy stuff here. This is pretty heavy. So he says there, uh, verse three, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, Wow. So you're going to go live in a box. You're going to sell all you have and you're going to give it to the poor people. All right. And if I surrender my body to what? To be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now, I probably mentioned that in my sermon today, that uh, there were Christians in the first century that were used as torches. Their bodies were lit on fire and they were torches for the emperor. So it did happen, guys. And it, it happened a lot throughout history. We see lots of people burned at the stake. Uh, last guy, last name uh, Ridley uh, was burned at the stake. Uh, there were several guys that you could go through and you can see that they really, uh, there's a story of one guy who he was in prison at night and he put his hand over a candle because they didn't have like, you know, electricity. So he put his hand over a candle and he prayed for hours before he did that. Lord, help me to be able to stand the pain of the flames because I know they're going to burn me tomorrow morning. And if I can't even take the pain of a candle, I'll denounce you tomorrow, Lord. And I don't want to do that. And uh, it, sure enough, the candle burned his hand and it hurt so bad. He had to recoil and he was so sad because he knew when they lit him up the next day, he was going to denounce Jesus and, uh, you know, they, they lit him up the next day. And you know what he said? He said, my Savior has been faithful to me for 70 years. I shall not uh, reject him now. And they lit him up uh, and he sang hymns when they lit him up. So, guys, there are lots of stories. If you want to read Fox's Book of Martyrs, one right after the other, but a lot of people that were caught on. So Paul says, I, if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, what does it do again? It profits me nothing. There is, It's like a love and marriage. How's that song go? Horse and carriage. You can't have one without the other. There's no such thing as like having peas in a pod and birds of a feather. We have a lot of sayings. You got to have one with the other. There's no such thing as marriage without love. There's no such thing as doing God's work without love. Now, what kind of love? Philadelphia love? No, not philos love. They, anybody can have philos love. If you, um, you don't have to be a Christian. There's lots of love in the world, right? Just like the love boat, just like we watched. That proves there's there's love in the world, right? Love in the air, right? Sure. But is there agape love with all the world? No, there's not. That's only with those that have the Spirit of God. So Paul is saying, please don't make the mistake. Just because you have uh, the ability to do things for God doesn't mean you're truly a Christian. <clears throat> now, hold your place here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, and let's see this example. This is the, this is the one that everybody will turn to, and it's a good one. Matthew 7. Is it possible that people could actually do miracles for God and not have the love of God in their hearts? Well, I think so. Look at verse 15. Mm. He's been talking about these, these Pharisees and how they've been judging people and they have a log in their eye, but they're pointing out the specks in other people's eye. He points out the golden rule uh, to treat others as you'd want to be treated. Uh, enter through the narrow gate. The way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. For the gate is small in verse 14 and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few that find it. Then he gets to verse 15 and he says, Beware of these false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves like the wolf in sheep's clothing. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from their uh, bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? In other words, you'll know the tree by their fruit. 
Verse 17, so every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Now, this seems elementary, doesn't it? Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know by know them by their fruits. Now, first thing people say is, well, I've been serving God, giving to the poor. I've been burned at the stake for Christ. I've been persecuted. I've done this and I've done that. And I've served my church. I've been in the church for 110 years, sang in the choir for 112. So I know that I absolutely have served God my whole life. They're just so convinced of it. Now, this would be these guys, but the fruit is missing. What's the fruit? Love. If you don't have eternal agape love, it's nothing. It's worthless. And so, verse 21, not everyone. Oh, boy, here we go. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Really? So there are those today that claim to be Christians and they call Jesus Lord of their, oh, Jesus is Lord of my life. You better know it. i tell you right now, I, I squeak when I walk for Jesus. I, I, I jump high for Jesus. I give him my life. I serve him. I give him my money, all my talents. And boy, they're out there on the street corners preaching and taking lumps for Jesus. Yep, they'd call him Lord, wouldn't they? Well, here's what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? You mean they're preachers? Well, they are preachers. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? You mean they cast out demons? Yes, they did. They could tell a demon what to do. Y'all ever tell demons what to do? These guys are... These pretty fancy guys here. And in your name, perform miracles? Guys, you ever perform a miracle before? I mean, just an obvious miracle? Well, these guys were doing it. Now, that, that's something else. Uh, people don't realize that when the, when, the, when the Spirit fell upon all flesh, there were people doing things that were supernatural that weren't saved. We see, read the book of Acts. You'll see people were people knew that people were having this gift. That's why they would go to Paul and say, Paul, how much how much money do I have to pay to get some of this power? Because there were people that had it that weren't necessarily saved. And so these guys had the ability to do these things. Verse 23. And then I will declare to them, come on in, buddy. Is that what he says? Come on in, buddy. I never knew you. And he uses that word, depart, right? I don't know you. Really? Yeah. Remember the guy in Acts? He was uh, delivering out demons. He was telling them what to do. And those demons finally had had enough. And they spoke back to Paul. Or they spoke back to him and they said, Jesus we know. And Paul we know. But you? We don't know you. And the Bible says they jumped on him and beat him half to death, <laughs> right? Because the guy was able, though, for a long time to mess with these demons. But there were some demons that were more powerful than other demons. And he finally came across some guy, some tougher ones. And they put it on him, right? But we obviously know that that guy, who they didn't know him from Paul and Jesus, he had the ability to do some really supernatural things. Guys, the only real barometer is do you have the love of God in your heart? That is really the, the litmus test for all Christianity. How do I know I'm a genuine Christian? Do you have the love of God? And you think of some of the churches today mm. and how mm. failing Oof. they are. Yeah. Because they're allowing belief in abortion. Yeah. They're allowing belief in right. the LG yeah. TV BTQ plus believes mm -hmm. in so many things yeah. that God does not really accept. Yeah. So that's a really good point you bring up because if we're going to stock talk to a homosexual or we're going to talk to uh, um, let's see, abortion clinic doctor. For example, if we're going to have that discussion, 
that person we're talking to could be saved, right? Yeah, you have to pray. For you have them to pray for them. We were Lord. saved and we're sinners. So really to have that hard talk with somebody might end up badly for you, wouldn't it? Because if you say something to them, it might end up bad. Because what if they're not going to accept Christ? What are they going to say about you? Why, you're a bigot. You're a hater. You're a, in other words, you know, you get get you fired. That'll get you ostracized from the local HOA. That'll get you put out of uh, clubs and committees and, you know, the country club or whatever you're part of. That'll get you kicked out. You know, that could really cost you to suffer. But was that love for you to mention to them that 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 lifestyle means you're living in sin and therefore you could not possibly be a Christian? And my heart is bleeding for you that I am genuinely. And, you know, don't say it's you are if you're not. But if you're praying for them and you 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 really are almost to the point of tears for them because, you know, their destiny, their eternal destiny is set in stone without Christ. And you say something, what are you risking? You're risking everything, aren't you? Uh, and, you know, everybody likes to be invited to the party, but you might not be. Barney always told me when I work downtown, love the person and pray yeah. for the sin. Pray, pray for the sin. Yeah, oh. good for that. They'll, they'll see it. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, good stuff. Thank you guys for that. All right. So uh, the context here in 1 Corinthians 13, what is the context? Well, context in this is broader discussion of gifts, right? That's really the broader context. Oh, great. Vicki says that in the garages during a race, she feels like she's telling demons what to do. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can only imagine, but in that case, she does have the spirit. So that's good. I can only imagine. So, uh, there, there, there's fighting going on in this church. Let's just say it the way it is. This church, they're, they're fighting with each other. They're not getting along. And the reason is there are people saying, I have the greater gifts. I have the greater gifts. So let's cheat a little bit and go to the end of the chapter. And let's, let's see if we can't solve the dilemma by reading the ending first. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13 again. So if you go to the end, they're fighting over who has the greater gifts. What does finally, what does Paul say in the last verse? 13, 13 is actually a good verse, right? What does it say? What's the greatest? But now faith, hope, and love abide with, with these, but the greatest of these is love. Love, yeah, yeah. So everybody's, can you imagine though how that might happen? If you could speak another language on cue, you would probably be looked at as what? How would people see you? Weird. Oh, no, not in a church. They oh, wouldn't see you as weird. What would they say to you? Because let's say a, a Spanish-speaking person comes in and they can't understand English, and you share the gospel with them in their language, and you didn't even know Spanish. Wow. That's what tongues is. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. They could speak their language. They would speak, and everybody understood them in their own language. So... Uh, what would people say in the church about you then? Wow. Impressive. That's great. Right. What if somebody walked in here and, um, you know, they broke their leg in a football game and you just went over and touched them and said, you won't be needing that walking cast anymore. And they got up and ran out. They just jogged around the room. What would everybody say about your, your, you in the church? Wow. Wouldn't they say, wow, wouldn't they say, you're amazing? Wouldn't it go to your head? Well, it did. It went to people's head. So they had categorized themselves at levels. Yeah, I, I've got one of those gifts you don't have. Sorry. Maybe there's something wrong with you. But if you can just get right with God, maybe God will give you some of this supernatural power like I've got. That's what was going on. But he finally sums up the chapter and he says, look, there's faith, there's hope, there's love. And the greatest of these is love. He even tells them to seek the greater gifts. You know what the greater gifts are in this chapter? It's not those things I mentioned. You know what they are? They are faith, hope, and love. Those are the greater gifts. 
Really? Now, would you have figured that the extraordinary gifts were not the actual best gifts? What I mean by extraordinary, meaning supernatural, the things that physical that you could see, those extraordinary things that somebody would walk in a church and go, wow, I've never seen that before. That's amazing. He says those are the lesser gifts. Wow. Let that sink in for just a minute. They're the lesser gifts. Yeah. He says, you should seek the greater gifts. Well, what are the greater gifts? Faith, hope, and love. Really? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Guys, that's why today in a church, you just don't see those extraordinary uh, manifestation gifts. They're called lots of things, but you don't see those in a church. Okay, how who, who's been going to this church the longest? You, you guys probably? Since I was six years old. How many physical healings have been done at the altar at the old church building? I don't remember any. It's like somebody came in and they literally had a warped arm or they had you know sores and somebody just touched them and they vanished. You hadn't seen one? Well, you know what a great deal of the of the church community would say about our church? You know what they'd say about us, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, duds. That's a good way to put it. You're just spiritual duds. Uh, yeah, I've had it said to me since I've been here. Well, you guys aren't. And uh, one family left the church and said, y'all aren't spiritual. You're just not spiritual. We're not staying here. You don't believe in the miracle work and power of God. And I said, let me tell you something, buddy. I wouldn't be standing here right now if there wasn't miracle work and power of God. I was going to say to me, yeah. the power of God yeah. is when you get someone to come forward Oof. to confess to their Confess faith. sin? Absolutely. Start living oh, that's the miracle of all miracles, that somebody would see their own sin and follow Christ and, and be obedient to him. Forgiveness for that. Oh, that is a miracle. That is the, that's what he's saying. Faith, hope. So you have faith in Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Hope. You have a new body, a new place to live forever with him. He's never going to forsake you or leave you. And the love of God in your heart, you start to love people that you would rather just smack in the face usually, <laughs> right? What? Where did that come from? That's a supernatural miracle working power of God. But see, what people do is they look and they say, wait a minute, I haven't seen the extraordinary. You guys can't be spiritual. You're, you're walking around sick or maimed or uh, you know unhealthy or you've got eye problems and ear problems and uh, you know you, you what's wrong with you people? You're not spiritual. I've wow. seen us get together in a group at the front of the church yeah. and put a hands on Sure, pray. pray. Absolutely. But yeah. I, we went because I went to high school with a guy who when I found out he'd become a preacher, I said, oh, there, there's no way. <laughs> and so he was at a, yeah. a local church, and we went there one day, and they did that healing yeah. thing. And I'm just going, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it used yeah. to go from place to place, and the same people yeah. would come along that were crippled or this yeah. or that. And they were they always the ones that were yeah. healed. And hey, God can still do it. If God, if if, if God, he, he, if God wants to heal, he'll heal. And if someone prays for someone and they get healed, praise God. Yes. But the point is that Paul is making is those are not the greater gifts. But if that happens, great. Can God do that? You betcha. God's still in the miracle working business. But that's not the greater ones. And so what's happened is our churches have traded in the faith, hope, and love. Those are important. They'd say they wouldn't take those out of the Bible for the extraordinary manifestation gifts. Those are the ones that prove whether you're, but not for Paul. It's, that's not the proof. In fact, people could do these things that weren't saved. Matthew chapter seven, miracles, prophecy, preaching. And if you're doing, if you're doing prophecy, that means that's supernatural. You're actually saying things that God gives you. You've got supernatural ability to say things. That's prophesying. And yet when Jesus saw them, he said, depart from me. I never knew you. So actually, it's the opposite. Those things don't prove necessarily you're a Christian, although they prove God can do miracles and they prove God is powerful. 
but it doesn't prove anything. So that's why we're reading this chapter. What proves that you are a genuine Christian? What was it? Love. Agape love. You can't look to the outside to prove it. It has to be uh, agape love in your heart, in your mind. So that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Do we have that love? Okay. Let me, let yep. me just ask, when you yep. say they're, they're being a prophet, are you saying that they're being a prophet of God or just a prophet like yep. what you would call someone a psychic these days? Good, good because point. Because a prophet yeah. of God yeah. has to have God's spirit in them. Yeah. And has to be 100% correct. It's the question that uh, Jonathan Edwards raised. I'm reading a book. Um, yeah. I'm, where did I do it? I think I actually have it right here. Yeah. It's um, it's Edwards's book, Charity and Its Fruit. And he, ra he raises the point, and he's got a whole chapter on it. And he just says that in that day, the spirit was falling upon all flesh. And that there were those that were prophesying that were not indwelt with the Holy Spirit. They were not saved, although it was the Spirit. Remember, uh, Jesus said, uh, the kingdom has come upon you to the Pharisees. He even said the kingdom is in you to the Pharisees. So there's what he lays out, and he goes through a whole lot of verses, which might be a good study for another time, but he actually lays out that in this first century, what had happened was there were people that were... Um, Remember Hebrews chapter four, you've tasted of the spirit and you've rejected it. So he, he is a lot of verses. He goes on and on and on that there literally were people that were tasting of the spirit's power, but they weren't truly converted and genuine in their and authentic in their Christian walk. They weren't truly saved, but they had the ability. So these guys, he takes this Matthew seven, literally that they were actually prophesying in his name, which is what it says. So he says that that's why they were shocked. That's what's the shock of it. They were actually preaching Jesus Christ. They were prophesying in his name. Now, like you say, the debate is, was that just something they were doing to make a little money? to get a little following or were they, were they doing it because of an influence on them and they were never converted? In other words, the spirit was influencing them and they were doing it, but for self-righteous reasons and not for true faith. I was going to say it was evil yeah. spirit. It, it, because there's, there's really two kinds of righteousnesses in the new Testament. There's self-righteousness and imputed righteousness. Self-righteousness is someone who truly does attempt through their own efforts to be saved. They truly try really hard. And if they were to see something that was of God, they would try to utilize it and use it to prove their worthiness. Right. And then there's the imputed righteousness. And it's that person that comes to themselves and says, you know, I'm a sinner and I have no hope except for the except for the work of Jesus Christ. And without him. I am lost forever. And they turn to Christ and he imputes his righteousness to them because they're not like the Pharisee who was praying a pretty big prayer. Remember their prayer in the temple? Uh, and, they, and, they, and they looked over to that sinner and said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like him. But then the publican prayed and said, Lord, I can't even look like he was beating his chest and said, I can't even look upon you because he saw his great sin. So Edward says, there were those that really did do the things that Paul was doing, that the other apostles were doing because of the spirit's power. That was so heavily when the kingdom broke in to the natural, the kingdom impacted a lot of people. And there were people who seized the moment that actually were using this power but they weren't converted. So that's a really, to me, it was an interesting chapter. Uh, I'm still weighing through that. So Scott asks a great, great question. Uh, do you have a follow-up to that or more comment to it that might add to the, you know, the study? The, you mentioned uh, Simon the Sorcerer. Yes. And uh, 
he had been doing what they would say would be called miraculous things. Yeah. Not by the power of God, though. Right. By demons sorcery or whatever. Right. Yeah. And, uh, he did profess some faith, some belief, but then he saw Peter. Yeah. Lay hands on and they got believers got the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then he said, how much can I pay to get this power? Hmm. Yeah. How yeah. much can I pay? Yes, because he wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. He was trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so. So Simon. Could yeah. Be, yeah. I'm saying this because we don't know what the end of his story. Right. But he could be one of those that say, didn't we in your name do this and this and yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. I think you could make that argument. Big time that somebody who is trying to be self-righteous then dabbles in demonic things because you're isn't if you look at uh, is it Second Corinthians eleven thirteen where Satan uh, his he has ministers of righteousness who this is Satan now he has ministers of righteousness that actually preach self righteousness they're preachers they're ministers. And it says he's an angel of light, right? He's an imposter. So he actually preaches uh, a false gospel and a false Jesus. Can that be some of our churches today? Yeah, sure. Self, Self-righteousness. There are two kinds of churches. Self-righteous, imputed righteous churches. That's that's the only two kind there are. And so it really boils down to that. So it's a great point where you could, I think you could equally say that um, God turns someone over to their own belief. So if somebody says, yeah, I'm not going to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, but I'm going to use Jesus to prove my own worthiness, which that sounds weird, doesn't it? That sounds strange. Who would do that? Well, welcome to religion them today. I mean, that's exactly what's going on. I'm going to get enough Jesus to prove I'm a good guy, but I don't need Jesus, Right. And they actually reject him while they're using him. Does that make sense? No. It's always been said that a relationship with God is through Christ, but religion, think of it this way. A relationship is God reaching down to us. Religion would be us trying to reach up to God. And so that's your, that's your two ways. And so no wonder Paul says, do you love each other at all? Because if you don't have eternal love for each other, then all this other stuff is just gobbledygook. That's a good theological term, gobbledygook. <laughs> you ever hear that one? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so growing a dead soul into a living one sure beats clearing up something that Neosporin might do as well. <laughs> <laughs> Neosporin, yeah, that's good. Neosporin religion is popular. Uh, you're on a roll this morning, Laux. That's right. Yeah, you are. That's what Vesta said. Okay, well, let, let's go in a little bit deeper into this, guys. We looked at Matthew 7. You know, at the very least, let me say this before we go. We just got a couple of minutes. This chapter should scare the willies out of us. It really should. Now, a lot of people say, the love chapter? Are you serious? They read it at every wedding I've ever been to. It's the love chapter. They know not what they readeth. <laughs> this, this chapter is serious. If you don't have the love of God, Paul says, nothing else you do is worth anything. If you don't have faith, hope, and especially love, something is so wrong that you should be scared, very scared, right? Love for the brethren. Now, what I'm about to say, please don't take it. Listen to what I'm saying, the full thing. We are living in a day where people forsake the assembling together. And Hebrews chapter 10 says, do not do that. Do not do that. Why? Now, here's the first thing someone's going to say. You legalist. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You're right. You're right. But if you don't love the brethren enough to go be with them, and you love your earthly family enough to be with them seven days a week, but you don't love your heavenly fa family enough to be with them fairly regularly, you know what Paul would say? Your religion is 
worthless. That's what he would say to us. Now, I just hit the heart. I, I, I hurt. Didn't that hurt a little bit? I love you, but I got to say it, right? Some people don't go to church at times because they have illnesses. They have other struggles. Let's don't be legalistic here. We're not trying to drop the law on somebody's head. We've always seen that can't be done. But do you get the point? I want to make sure I'm understood. If you don't have this feeling of I can't go away, I can't wait to go be with God's family today. Something is awry. Something's wrong. I'm not saying our church is the place you go. I'm saying believers. Right. Does this make sense? OK, well, I got two calls this week. I got which is really strange to two in one week. One lady named Marsha, another nice man named Joe. And Marsha started talking to me and said, look, we're looking for a church. She lives right there at that house on the other side of the road right there. She said, we're looking for a church. We've, we're tired of driving to Pittsburgh or whatever. I said, well, we'll be your place. Come on down. She said, well, let me ask you something. What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe? And she wanted to know the details of what we believed. And then a second phone call. His name is Joe. He lives on 32. He's first turn when you turn on to 32 off of, uh, was that 100 or 300? I forget what that is up here when you turn right. 300. You turn left, uh, second house on the left. He called. He said, look, I would like a statement of your beliefs before our family visits. Would you please bring them to me? Yes. So we made up a file and put all kinds of information in it. And yesterday I took it down there to him. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? I am not saying that you just willy nilly pick a church and go because they all call themselves believers and just start loving on them. And, you know, does it matter what you believe? Yeah. See, if you don't have right doctrine. Something's wrong. So you can't just jump into the end of a book like 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and forget what's in the rest of the book. Paul's laying out the importance of doctrine. Then he lays out the application. So we're not divorcing. When we do this study, we've got a couple more weeks left on this. We're not divorcing what we believe with a feeling of love. What we're saying is the belief system is the love. All right. What do I mean by that? If you believe that this is eternal love that God has given to you, all right? Eleanor knows she's going to go to heaven and be with the Lord forever for eternity. How come she gets to go there? She's the sweetest person in the room, I think. I think she's the sweetest person in the room. That's why I'm picking her. Besides, besides everybody else, right? <laughs> besides everybody else. But I'm going to give her the crown of sweetest person in the room. All right. You would automatically assume, well, Eleanor is good to go. She's sweet. She's nice. Right. But no, that's not what gets Eleanor into heaven. What gets Eleanor into heaven is the love of God who forgives sin because he's long suffering and he's patient and he, he loves her. Right. That love that saves that even has to save Eleanor. How much more do we need that love? Right. We really need. I'm going to speak for myself on this one. I need a whole lot of love. <laughs> if, if she got a thimble full, I need a barrel full because <laughs> I'm going to need that love. Well, that same love that was shed abroad, the Bible says in Romans, it was shed abroad in your heart. That love of God in Christ was shed abroad in your heart. What automatically happens when you experience that love? Well, the love of God then is shed abroad in your heart and then spreads out to other people. The reason Paul's bringing this up is he's saying, wait, we need to do a check here because two chapters prior to this, there were people taking the Lord's Supper who were not saved. They had not examined themselves. And guess what happened to them? They got sick and they died. First Corinthians 11. So he gave them an examination and said, wait a minute. Do you really understand what Christ has done for you? Because the way you treat each other. Remember, what were some of the church members doing? Just because I call you a church member doesn't mean you're saved, right? The church members. What, what, what were they doing in the Lord's Supper? Well, they were eating it all. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing other people aside. yeah, that's right. They came in and ate up all the food. Well, we deserve it. We're the stem winders in the church. We deserve to eat the steak and the lobster, and then we'll leave the Brussels sprouts for whoever wants them, right? Always somebody brings Brussels sprouts to the fellowship, <laughs> right? And I'm not knocking, but I actually like them. So, but uh, you you see what I mean? They were coming in and they were, they did they have love for the, for the lesser ones that maybe they didn't have a ride to church that day and somebody went and picked them up and they got there late and there was hardly any food left. Now it's called a love feast, by the way, which was ironical. The love feast, 
You ate up all the food and left scraps. What should you do? Paul says, who should go first? The lesser. The lesser ones should get in the line first. See, now we're we're going to spend next week. We're going to start talking about how I, I put it to crocodile Christianity. Look, I, I know we all have jaws. We got some teeth, every one of us, and boy, we can use them, <laughs> right? Do you know crocodiles will carry their eggs in their mouths as well? Mama crocodile who rips wildebeests apart with her jaw and rolls around and tears. You know what they do when they come across a bone? Just smash them with their jaws, with their bite force. And the same jaws pick up their eggs and carry them. The same jaws. And the babies. And the babies. Yeah. All the babies climb in. And they grab the baby with those jaws that they can that they can destroy a wildebeest leg bone with. They pick their babies up, throw them in there, and then they crawl around in their mouth. So what does that tell us? What Paul is saying is, look, and we're going to get to it next week. That old tongue, whoo, it's like the what James says, the rudder of a ship, right? But Paul says, you know what you, you can do with that old mouth if you're not careful? Oh, you can smash some people with it, right? Or you can do what with it? You can love people. Show the love of Christ to them, right? We've got a choice to <laughs> eat the wildebeest or carry the babies. And we're supposed to be treating people like they're babes in Christ and that they need us to nurture them and bring them up uh, gently, right? So. And the church is the people in it. Yeah. It is not yeah, that's not the building. It's not the organization. It's the it's the organism. It's the people that are saved by the Spirit. Yeah. And it, it bothers yeah. me some yeah. that have left mm. because mm. they, well, I've grown up in this church. Well, yeah. So have I. Yeah. Amen. Amen. This is my family. It's your family. Here. Yeah. Families have struggles. You know. I don't know a family that doesn't. You know. I don't know. Well, God bless you guys. You got to hear me again here in a minute. Where, hey, look, say a, a, a little, a little prayer as you go in there for me. We're going to do end time stuff, and I have, I'm telling you, I've spent weeks and weeks on it. And how, how you not get lost in all of it? It's hard. I've tried the best I can. I, I said I'm walking in there with two pages of notes, and I'm not walking in with another note. And I'm just going to go in there with it, and whatever happens, happens. We'll see, but. Yeah, I want to do end time stuff because of all the COVID stuff and is Antichrist coming and what is all that? And I've never done it. It's been seven years. I haven't done it here. And I, I want to try it for a few weeks. So just keep me in mind while I'm up there because I want to. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to do a good job with it. But guys, it's it's just something that uh, it's important. I think we should know it. We should be blessed. Revelation says you're blessed to know this book. But at the same time, it's a daunting task because I know that it can get drudgery. It get what you know. It can you can get lost in the whole. You get out in the weeds. Get out in the weeds real quick, and it's not what I want to do with it. Okay, thank you guys. We'll see you out over yonder. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, we want to know where the Lauks are actually for their, um, for their race. Are you in St. Louis? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. My computer is a little slow to get the. Oh, St. Louis. Great. Awesome. Okay, guys. Well, keep directing those demons. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Okay, guys. Thanks again. Lord willing, the creek doesn't rise. We'll see you in a few minutes. I'm going to be preaching at around 1040 or so. So. Thank you guys. Bye. Uh,